Hi everyone, and thanks for tuning in. I'm excited to tell you about one of my most recent projects, which is to perform Bach's Goldberg variations on the organ. The Goldberg Variations is a timeless masterpiece that is loved by Bach aficionados. At the same time, it has attracted the attention of people who normally do not listen to classical music. I often like to compare the Goldberg Variations with Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. They both share similar enigmatic and mystifying qualities. How is it possible in the case of Bach that the human mind can create such impeccable counterpoint in essence, mathematical perfection at the level of a supercomputer and still create something that is so organic and natural and beautiful sounding. It is a piece that is considered by many to be one of the most difficult in the keyboard repertoire and it is extremely virtuosic. At the same time, all of the effort invested into learning and performing it comes back a thousandfold to the audience and to the performer. What some people may not know is the fact that it was written originally for a harpsichord with two keyboards, or manuals as we call them, and it is one of the few pieces that Bach published during his lifetime. We may give our thanks to Count Karl Hermann von Kaiserlink, who was the Russian ambassador to the electoral court of Saxony at the time. Kaiserlink had insufferable insomnia and commissioned Bach to write some music to keep him entertained during sleepless nights. So, whenever he couldn't sleep, he would call upon Johann Gottlieb Goldberg, who was a musician in the service of the Count, to perform him some of his variations. And this is how the term Goldberg Variations was born. That term was likely never used by Bach himself. He published the piece under Aria with 30 variations. The term first appeared in Bach's earliest biography by Johann Nikolaus Forkel. Forkel also claimed that Bach had never been so rewarded for any of his works. The Count gave him a golden goblet filled with a hundred gold coins. Yet, he also says, had the gift been a thousand times larger, the artistic value of this piece would not yet have been paid for. While the Goldberg Variations were written for harpsichord, it is today most commonly performed on the piano. So technically, it is an arrangement or a transcription of the original. But just because it isn't performed on the harpsichord doesn't make it at all a lesser piece. In fact, some of the most legendary recordings have been performed on the piano. Today I would like to show you just a couple of examples of why the Goldberg Variations are so mind-blowing. One of the compositional techniques that Bach utilizes is the canon. As many of you know, a canon constitutes at least two voices that play the exact same melody but that are displaced by time. In other words, the first voice enters, which is known as the leader, and before it has finished its tune, a second voice enters, which is known as the follower, playing the exact same tune. Throughout history, composers have been fascinated with canons, especially because they are extremely difficult to create. They are, in a way, musical puzzles or brain teasers, if you will. Now, Bach wasn't the only person who has written canons, of course, but he has by far created some of the most elaborate ones. Let me show you what I mean. This is the tune that Bach composed for his first canon in variation number three. Next, let me add the second voice, the follower, and I'll play it for you in a non-displaced fashion, both voices starting at the same time, and you will hear that the two voices are indeed identical. Now, the way Bach wrote this music is that if you displace the follower by one measure, you get a canon that is not just perfectly composed and adheres to all the rules of Baroque counterpoint, but sounds enchantingly beautiful.
And finally, if we add the bass line the way it was written in this variation, we have something that sounds like this. While this is already quite impressive, let me show you why Bach was an absolute master in composition. Apparently, simply writing a canon was not challenging enough for him. In each of the subsequent canons throughout the entire set of the variations, Bach will not enter the follower on the same note as the leader, like we just saw in the first example, but rather he will enter the follower on a different pitch at increasingly larger intervals. So, in variation number six, the second voice enters a whole note apart from the first voice, which is known as a canon at the second. In the case of variation number nine, we've got a canon at the third, variation number 12, we've got a canon at the fourth, and so on, and so on, and so on, all the way up to a canon at the ninth. Let me show you why this is so unbelievable. Here we have the tune for variation number six, which sounds like this. Above we have the voice of the follower, but one whole note higher than the leading voice. If you play both voices together in a non-displaced fashion, you get something that sounds like this. Not the most flattering sound, but if you displace them in the way that Bach had in mind, you will get a result that sounds like this. And finally, if you combine the canon with the bass line, you get the full picture of variation number six. Now, if you think this is the end of what Bach had to offer, think again. Apparently, writing a canon and having the second voice enter on a totally different pitch was still not challenging enough for Bach. In variation number 12, Bach takes us one step further. In addition to separating the second voice by a fourth, he also takes the tune and flips it upside down, which is known as an inversion. Let me show you what that means. Here's the tune that Bach works with in variation number 12. This tune is then basically flipped upside down to create a mirror image of the original tune. And it is a fourth apart from the leading voice to be consistent with the rest of the variations. Finally, combining them with the bass line brings the whole variation together. As you can see, what Bach does with canons is simply staggering. And this is just one of the reasons why some musicians believe that Bach's compositional skill is unparalleled by any composer in history. This is just the tip of the iceberg, and there's so much more to discover. Ultimately, this monumental masterpiece must be experienced live and in person. I myself could not think of a more majestic way to present the Goldberg Variations than on the organ, or the king of instruments, as Mozart called it. I hope that you enjoyed this brief introduction to the Goldberg Variations, and I hope that we will soon see each other at one of my upcoming performances.